This is the WGBH Forum Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fort Hall Forum and to the historic Old South Meeting House, where we're privileged to hold so many of our programs. Welcome to this evening's program on Hispanic Americans with former Congressman Herman Badillo. My name is Jeff Jacoby. I'm a columnist for the Boston Globe and a member of the Fort Hall Forum Board of Directors. Just a word about the forum for those of you who may be joining us for the first time. This is the nation's oldest free public lecture series. For nearly a century now, the Fort Hall Forum has provided a platform for some of the most intriguing, important, even infamous figures in American history. Over the years, speakers at the forum have included Clarence Darrow, Robert Frost, Martin Luther King, Henry Kissinger, Ayn Rand, Eleanor Roosevelt, Malcolm X, and scores more. Half of each program is devoted to questions and comments from the audience, and today's program will be no exception. All of our programs are open to the public at no charge, and to make that possible, we are very grateful to members whose generosity we benefit from. If you're not already a member, please consider joining us. There is membership information at the table near the door. One request before we begin, if you haven't already, please turn off or silence any cell phones that you might have with you. And now to introduce tonight's program. You don't have to be Hispanic to care about the failure of so many Hispanic Americans. As much as 50% of Hispanic children in this country don't graduate from high school, more than 20 million Hispanics 18 years and older have either a weak or no command of the English language. Only 12% of native-born Hispanics have earned a college degree. By contrast, among Asian Americans, the figure is nearly 50%. According to the Census Bureau, more than one in five American Hispanics lives below the poverty line, and the Justice Department reports that based on current rates of incarceration, 17% of Hispanic males will enter state or federal prison at some point in their lives. In short, among Hispanic Americans in the 21st century, there is far too much failure and underachievement and far too little success. Why that is, and what can be done about it is the topic that tonight's speaker has come to address. Herman Badillo was born in Puerto Rico in 1929, and he was sent at age 11, after both his parents had died, to live with a relative in the United States. He graduated from City University of New York with a degree in business and accounting, then later earned a law degree at Brooklyn Law School. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from the South Bronx in New York, becoming thereby the first member of Congress born in Puerto Rico. He left Congress to become deputy mayor of New York City under former Mayor Ed Koch, who was later named chairman of the Board of City University of New York by former Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Today he practices law. He's a senior fellow as well at the Manhattan Institute of Policy Research. Mr. Badillo's book is called One Nation, One Standard, an ex-liberal on how Hispanics can succeed just like other immigrant groups. In it, he writes with startling candor, as a member of Congress, I led efforts to establish bilingual voting and bilingual education programs. While well-intentioned, these programs backfired drastically because of the explosive combination of racial politics and the ingrained incompetence of our public school system. Agree with him or disagree with him, Mr. Badillo is known for speaking his mind, and I'm delighted that he is here to do so tonight. As always, at about 7.15, we will open up the microphone for questions from the audience. Uh, the, the mic is located here in the front, and you'll need to come up the side aisle and line up behind it at the appropriate time. Please do be aware that tonight's program is being recorded both for the WGBH Forum Network as well as for C-SPAN. So if you offer a comment or question during the second half, do be sure to use the microphone so that you'll be heard. Also, please understand that by speaking, you are giving your consent to being recorded. And with that, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Herman Badillo. Thank you, Jeff. I'm very happy to be invited to speak at this uh, ancient forum and to know that it was the, uh, the meeting place for the Boston Tea Party, for which I'm very happy that the Boston Tea Party took place. I am, and this book that I wrote has to do with the Hispanic community now and in the future in the United States. That's the first subject and the problems of the Hispanic community. I also want to talk about the 
controversy over immigration. And finally, I want to speak about the problems that the educational community presents, not just to the Hispanic community, but to uh, the students as a whole. With respect to the Hispanic community, it's important to know that we represent today the largest ethnic group in this country. We're about 44 million people, and that's 15% of the U.S. population. And that does not include many of the uh, illegal uh, immig immigrants and uh, 4 million uh, Hispanics in Puerto Rico. Uh, by in the next 50 years, we're going to be 25% of the U.S. population, and that will be about uh, over 102 million people. And therefore, uh, if the, we have a problem with a population that's 15 to 25 percent of the U.S. population, and that group is not performing, that is a serious national problem, not just for the Hispanic community, but for the nation as a whole. And uh, as a result of my background in government, and by the way, I started in government and in politics with uh, John Kennedy for president. I was, uh, after I graduated from uh, law school, I joined the presidential campaign for Kennedy. I was in charge of his campaign for East Harlem. And uh, uh, Kennedy came with Jackie to my clubhouses, which started with one person, me. And by the time he came, we had a rally of 20,000 people. And the one who got the biggest applause was not uh, John Kennedy, but Jackie, because she spoke Spanish fluently and she was pregnant with uh, John Jr. So after I got, uh, I completed the campaign for Kennedy, I went into uh, public office as a city commissioner, then as president of the Bronx, which is about a million five hundred thousand people. Then I went to Congress and was the first Puerto Rican a member of Congress, as has been said, because there are books written about me. There are many kids who think that I died a long time ago because uh, the figure, if I was the first Puerto Rican in Congress, that must have been around 1795 or so, and they don't understand why I'm still around. Uh, but after that, I became deputy mayor, and in the last 15 years, I have been focusing on education as chairman of the board of the city university and as a uh, special counsel for education for Mayor Giuliani and as an advisor to Mayor Bloomberg. And the reason for that is that I believe that education is the uh, biggest problem that the Hispanic community has. As was pointed out when I was introduced, over 50% of the Hispanic kids don't even graduate from high school. And the uh, Secretary of Education has said that today in the jobs that exist today and in the future, you're going to need at least two years of college if you're going to be able to perform. If you don't graduate from high school, it means you are doomed to a life of deliveries and working in restaurants and a life of no opportunity. So that has to change. And this book is a call to the Hispanic community and to the rest of the population uh, to bring about a change so that the Hispanic community gives a greater priority to education than it does at the present time. Unfortunately, uh, when we have parent-teachers conferences in many of the schools, Hispanic parents don't show up. They don't get involved in their child's education. They don't ensure that they are doing their homework and that they are performing. And, uh, of course, there are excuses for this. The parents have to work hard. They have sometimes two jobs or more. They may have problems at home. They may not, uh, they may be single mothers. Uh, and, and that means they have to work harder. But the point is, they have to make that effort. And I point to one other group that has similar problems coming here uh, as people who do not speak English, who are discriminated against, and who are very poor. And that is the Asian community. They have exactly the same problems that Hispanics complain about. And yet, that community, in one generation, is able to perform even better than the rest of the people in this country because although they're only 4% of the U.S. population at colleges, Ivy League colleges like Harvard, Columbia, 
Yale, the Asian population is about 20% of the student body. And why is that? Because the Asian community gives a tremendous priority to education. They get involved in what their children are doing. They ensure that their children do their homework and that not just the parents, but the entire extended family sees to it that the children perform and they do. So it is possible, even within the uh, present uh, uh, inadequate educational system to succeed, and the Asians have proven that to be the case. And that's what I point to that the Hispanic community has to do. Let me talk a little bit now about the issue of immigration, because as a member of Congress, I have long been aware of the fact that we had a huge percentage of immigrants from Latin America coming to the United States in the last 60 years. In fact, the migration of Hispanics to the United States is probably larger in numbers and percentage than the migration of Europeans to the United States in the 19th and early 20th century. And the reason for that has to do with, which, with what I referred to in my book as the 500-year siesta, because uh, the Hispanics were in this country long before the uh, the pilgrims came. Ponce de Leon came to uh, Florida in 1508 looking for the Fountain of Youth. And uh, some of us are still looking for it. Uh, but the point is that uh, the discover discoverers of uh, much, a large part of the United States come from Spain originally. And Spain was in control of most of Latin America for over 300 years until Napoleon conquered Spain, and then the countries of Latin America came into existence. But during those 300 years, Spain was never interested in doing anything to improve the conditions of the people who lived in Latin America, because they were only interested in bringing back gold and silver to Spain. And uh, they never had, during that period of time, what we had in this country. There was no industrial revolution. There was no economic development. In fact, Spain set up a uh, system that was comparable to feudalism, where you had overlords supervising the masses, which, by the way, included Indians. And uh, the countries never really progressed. When Napoleon took over the, uh, Spain and the l countries of Latin America became independent, then the people who took over were basically uh, dictators, what we call in Spanish caudillos, who lasted for a long period of time. For example, Porfirio Diaz stayed in Mexico for over 20 years. And therefore, even today, there's nothing unusual about people like Castro staying in office for 30 or 40 years. And they usually are, like Chavez and Castro, people who are military men who took over take over. But in the meantime, even today, nothing is done to improve the conditions of the Latin American countries. Latin America has about 50 percent of the people who are living in poverty. And shortly after the Second World War, the Hispanic community in Latin America decided not to wait anymore for their countries to be developed and to come to the United States. And they began to come in large numbers, and they continue to come. And I am telling you they will continue to come because the conditions in Latin America are so abysmal. In fact, in the year 2003, Vicente Fox, who was then the president of Mexico, went on television and he told his people that, well, there are 100 million Mexicans and 50 million of you are living below the level of poverty. And I don't think that within the time I have left in office, I will be able to improve conditions, which was a very elegant way of telling them, get out of here and go to the United States, which they did, and they continued to come. The president, uh, president of Mexico, Calderon, actually came here shortly after he was elected, and he said he comes from a section of Mexico where half of the population is already here in the United States illegally. And you think you'd be ashamed of that, but he wasn't at all. 
In fact, now we have a situation where the leaders of Mexico and the Latin American countries want there for there to be more illegal people coming in because they're counting on the money that they send back. The second largest amount of revenue, foreign aid, that Mexico receives comes from the immigrants that send money back. The first largest amount of money from foreign aid that Ecuador receives comes from the immigrants here. So that now what is happening is that the leaders of the Latin American countries are exporting the poor to the United States as a matter of policy. And what I say in my book is that we have to take action against those leaders. We have influence over them to force them to improve the economic conditions because the resources are there. It's just that they never get down to the masses. They have never set up an educational system. For example, would you believe that the wealthiest man in the world, in the whole world, is a Mexican whose name is Carlos Slim? And he, from my point of view, is the one who really controls Mexico because he is so wealthy, but nothing of that goes down to the people. And we have the resources, and we should be taking action to ensure that conditions improve. In the meantime, we have to come to grips with the problems of those who are here because it is estimated that we have between 12 and 20 million illegal immigrants in the United States, mostly from Latin America. And we are, are not going to be able to deport them. I'm telling you as a lawyer, you can't deport that many people. We don't have enough lawyers. We don't have enough judges. We don't have enough prosecutors. So we have to come up with a comprehensive immigration plan that ensures that they would pay a penalty for coming here illegally, that they are able to learn to speak English and, and learn about our countries, the traditions of places like this uh, meeting house, and uh, ensure that they can become American citizens. That is the kind of policy that we're going to have to develop over the years, because otherwise we are going to continue with people who uh, are going to be living in the shadows, and we cannot have a large percentage of our population that we cannot even identify. But as I say, in the meantime, we have to take action against the uh, leaders of Latin American countries to see to it that they improve their economies. And this can be done because in the last 40 years, a country like South Korea has been able to move into the first world from being in the third world, and uh, so has Taiwan, so have other uh, South uh, East Asian countries. And the techniques that they have used are techniques that can be used in the Latin American countries. So within the next uh, 20 or 30 years, they can improve their economies. And to both of those things, taking action here for a comprehensive immigration bill and um, forcing the leaders of the Latin American countries to improve the condition where the immigrants come from are things that are necessary if we are going to solve the problem of immigration. But now I want to talk about another problem which I consider to be equally serious, and that affects not just the Hispanic community, but the black community in this country as well. And that has to do with what I call the dysfunctional educational system that we have, because what we really have in this country in education is a double standard, which is very harmful to the black community and to the Hispanic community. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean. There are such things as social promotion, which exist. They exist in New York City and in other parts of this country. Social promotion means that in the educational system, if you do your work, you pass, and if you don't do your work, you pass. You are promoted from one grade to another, not because you've learned anything, but because you get to be a year older. That's why it's called social promotion. You are socially a year older. And they say that this is done uh, because it's sociologically bad for a child to be left behind. But I say it's sociologically worse for a child to be 17 years old and not be able to read or write or do arithmetic. And what happens is the children are passed on and on 
from one grade to the other. When they get to the eighth or ninth grade, they drop out. And they drop out because at that point, they're 17 years old, and they no longer have to be in school. And so we lose them. That's why we have over 50% of the kids not graduating from high school. Another technique which, and of course, I've been working to abolish social promotion over the years and have been only partially successful because it is ingrained in the educational system and it affects primarily uh, Hispanic and black children. Another practice that exists is the practice of what is called tracking. And that is a separate curriculum for whites and a separate lower curriculum for uh, blacks and Latinos. And what happens is they go along this different track and they're not really learning. They're not learning about the classics. They're not learning about what needs to be done to value education in this country. And that what really that is, is official segregation, but not segregation as the South used to have, but segregation within the same school because the kids go into one school, one group of kids goes into the higher curriculum, another one goes into the lower. And one is learning and the other one is not learning. And that has to be abolished. We also have things like vocational schools, which train kids for jobs that do not exist. And that happened even to me. When I came here from Puerto Rico, I couldn't speak English. When I went to high school, I had a strong accent. So I found that I was doing airplane mechanics in New York City. I learned how to draw uh, blueprints, how to make model airplanes, but I thought it was boring. So I saw that there was a school newspaper. I joined the school newspaper. I began to write for the school newspaper. I did interviews with people like Peggy Lee. I had many front page stories. Finally, one of the kids said, are you a student in this school? I said, yes. He said, but we don't see you in any of our classes. I said, well, I'm taking airplane mechanics. So he said, well, what are you taking that for? That's for blacks and Puerto Ricans. I said, well, I'm Puerto Rican. He said, no, you don't understand. You have a strong accent, but you obviously are bright enough to go on to college. If you stay in that course, you never will be able to go to college. You have to switch to the academic course. And I said, oh, so I did. I was admitted to the City College of New York, which was then the Harvard of the Poor. I graduated magna cum laude from City College. I graduated number one in my class in law school, and nobody could figure this out in high school. And that's the reason why I talk about the dysfunctional educational system, because they're still training kids in New York City for airplane mechanics, and those jobs don't really exist in New York City, if they ever did. And there are many other such uh, vocational schools that do not train kids for jobs that exist at all. There are also problems, such as bilingual education. This one is my fault. I was the one who sponsored bilingual education when I was in Congress. But my idea was to help kids who, like me, couldn't speak the language. I figured the problem is that if you're learning to speak the language, as you learn to speak the language, it takes time. So you lose the course content. And then when you learn the language, you are behind several grades. So I figured if you have bilingual education, you can get the course content in Spanish while you're learning to speak English so that at, when you learn to speak English, you are not behind. That was my idea. The purpose of bilingual education was to get the kids to speak English. And the problem is that we thought in Congress that this could be done in a couple of years. But what's going on is that now bilingual education programs are going on for four, six, and eight years. And in fact, the kids are learning neither language so that they end up dropping out. That also needs to be corrected. There are many other problems. I'll just give one more. Special education. We wrote in Congress the bill for Americans with learning disabilities, which became special education. Special education was to be supposed to be for kids with serious disabilities, but in fact it has become a dumping ground for kids who have problems. Once they get into special education, they never get out of special education. So that, that is what I mean by the double standard, these examples and others. 
that exists because that double standard applies primarily to uh, black and Latino kids. And um, at the same time that this is going on, educators talk about closing the achievement gap between whites and blacks and Hispanics. But in fact, they've created the achievement gap. And we're never going to close the achievement gap if we do this. So we have an urgent necessity to reform the entire educational system in order to ensure that this does not continue. Because having that double standard is very, very serious and very damaging to both groups. The worst part of that is that we come up with a concept which I think has got to be eliminated, and that is the concept of the majority and the minority. We talk about a minority group, blacks and Hispanics, and a majority group. Now, in Puerto Rico, where I come from, we have people from every background because we have people who are white, we have people who are black, we have people who are mixed, we have people who are Asians, we have people who are native uh, Indians. But we never divide ourselves into which of us is a white Puerto Rican and which is a black Puerto Rican and which is a mixed Puerto Rican. We, and neither does anybody else in the Latin American countries. We speak of ourselves as one group. We don't have that designation of majority and minority. That designation is very damaging to both groups, to the white community and to the black and Latino community, because when the kids go to school and they read about being majority and minority, they somehow feel that they are really a part of the minority which is not the equal of the part of the majority. In that sense, we in Latin America are several generations ahead of the people in the United States. And this is what we have got to change if we are going to become truly a united nation. We go back, we have to go back to the idea of having one standard for all. And that is why I call my book, One Nation, One Standard. That's what we should do if we're going to be able to move ahead as a group. Thank you very much. got a little bit of extra time, so perhaps I'll uh, begin this evening's questioning with uh, a few questions that occurred to me as I went, read through the book over the weekend. Uh, you just mentioned, you just ended your remarks by speaking about the question of race and how in Hispanic culture and the Puerto Rican culture that you grew up with, pe people don't make the same kind of racial divisions that Americans uh, seem to grow up with. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about the trend to increasingly treat Hispanics as a race unto themselves. You see that more and more in the way uh, public affairs are discussed in this country. There are some Hispanic activist groups like La Raza, which uh, encourage this kind of thinking. La, La Raza means the race. I wonder if you think it's a healthy phenomenon, uh, and if not, what can be done to, to stop it? Well, we are not a race, as I mentioned. We represent all different races. However, um, what happened was that at the beginning when I got involved in politics, the Census Bureau used to say of whites, blacks, and Asians. And a number of us, including me, met with the Census Bureau and we told them this is a category which we don't fit in because we represent, we have people who are either white, blacks, Asians, or people who are a mixture. So therefore, I said, we should I want to set up a separate category called Hispanics. And the reason for that is that you have a big problem in this country between whites and blacks. And we don't want to get involved in that problem. Having us break ourselves down into which of us is whatever category it may be will not help us and it won't help you. I would rather that we have a category known as Hispanics where we remain identified as a separate group hoping that our example might lead to your cutting out these racial categories. And so that is why, if you get the census, you'll see that it has a category known as Hispanics, which I always check. And uh, of course, that's very confusing to a lot of people, but that's the intention, to let people know that there should be a, uh, that kind of division by race 
should not exist. What determines, just to follow up this point, what determines whether someone is Hispanic? If the child of Irish immigrants marries the child of, uh, of uh, immigrants from Puerto Rico, are, are their children considered Hispanic, it, or is it, it simply it, a matter of self-definition? It, it's self-definition. You can check that category. Many Hispanics, I will say most Hispanics, do check it, but there are many who don't, who check white or black or whatever it may be. I mean, we can't compel people how they should do it, but my opinion is that it's better if we do not break ourselves down into which group we belong to. Why don't we start with our questioners? The microphone is in a slightly different place, so you need to come up through the side and, and line up behind it. Go ahead, sir. Congressman, absent, <clears throat> absent from your prescriptions on what to do about illegal immigration, no mention here of enforcement at the borders by you. Now, I know in your book you talk about yeah. walls will not work. Will walls not work. will not work. We can so, have... So, yeah, if I can just ahead. finish. So are you in favor of a strictly guarding the borders and making sure illegals don't get in? And along with that, given the fact that we have all these illegals here, what, which camp are you in? Are these illegals a net gain, or have they been a net benefit overall, in your view? Well, let me answer the first question. We should enforce the border and make our own Mexico, but if we really are serious about enforcing the borders, we have to enforce them all around the United States because we have a lot of illegal immigrants who come to New York City from the Dominican Republic, for example. And many of them come here by plane. They get a visa and then they overstay the visa. So that enforcing immigration along the border is not going to work. Many also come from Canada. So unless we had, and we, nobody is proposing, guarding the borders along the entire United States, that is not going to be effective. The immigrants who come here, come here to work and they, they uh, find useful employment and they work very long hours for little pay. Uh, so that they do, to that extent, create a benefit from this country. But I, what I would like to see is have them create a greater benefit to this, uh, to this country, as did the people who came to you from Europe. Because the people who came from Europe were also poor, looking for opportunity. They didn't have to... Uh, have the burden of being called illegal because they were able to come here legally. But yet the poor people of Europe from whatever country they came really were able to move ahead if you look into the history when they found the opportunity for education. And now that is true even more so in the 21st century. So that's my point of view on that. Sure, go ahead. There are measures being taken in places like Arizona right now sanctioning employers and seems to be working based on reports that I've seen. The illegals are giving up trying to find work in Arizona illegally. Some are even going back to Mexico, giving up. Are you encouraged by these measures which are proving to have some little teeny tiny bit of the discouragement of illegals remaining here? No, I'm not because we've had the sanctions in effect for many, many years, even back to the time that I was in Congress. And what happens is that those sanctions are only enforced on a pilot program basis, just like the uh, immigration. Have you ever wondered, for example, why is it that immigration never goes into an area where they know that a large number of illegal immigrants are living? For example, we know that is so in Washington Heights in New York City. The reason for that is that if immigration goes in and they arrest the father and the mother, they cannot take the children because the children were born here and they're American citizens. And immigration doesn't have any child care centers. So therefore, what they do is they make a show of force. They arrest some people in the workplace, but they really do not even attempt to go after the 12 to 20 million illegal immigrants that there are. Mr. Padilla, thank you for coming. I have two questions. The first one is, are there regional differences in success within the United States and the Hispanic community? And the reason I ask is because I grew up in Miami, spent 22 years there, and it always seemed to me like they were, the Hispanic community in Miami really thrived. Yes, there, of course there are differences. The Cuban community in Miami and Florida primarily has a different problem altogether because 
the Hispanics who are here, like those from Mexico or Latin America or Puerto Rico, like me, we came here because we were poor. My father died when I was a, when I was a year old, my mother when I was five, because there was an epidemic of tuberculosis. So, and the whole town was decimated, because in those days, tuberculosis was incurable. The Cubans who came were not the poor. They were the middle class, at least in the first wave. They had sent their money over to uh, Miami in advance, and therefore, and they were more, uh, had a higher degree of education. For example, when I was working on bilingual education, and some of my colleagues in Congress asked me, is there an example of a successful bilingual education program? I would send them to Dade County, because there you had a magnificent bilingual education program, because the teachers were former professors at the University of Havana. And they were there to ensure that the Hispanic children, Cuban children, learned to speak both English and Spanish, because they were expecting to go back to Cuba tomorrow. They're still expecting to go back to Cuba tomorrow after all these years, but uh, it hasn't worked out that way. So that's a different group. The rest of the group, the Mexicans, for example, have been in the United States before there was a United States. As a matter of fact, when I was in Congress, a group from La Raza came to see me, and they wanted me to introduce a resolution at the United Nations to give back to Mexico the areas that we had stolen from them, Texas, Arizona, California, all of those states, because they believe that that was part of Mexico. And many of them still believe that it's part of Mexico. So for them, crossing the border is just going from one section of their country to another. And my other question is, um, actually, can you just speak a little bit about the cultural success of the co Hispanic community? Because if you look at music and art and film, there's been a lot of success among the Hispanic community. Oh, yes, there's been a lot of success, uh, not just in, uh, in the movies, but in every area of life. There are many Hispanics who are successful. Desi Arnaz, as you remember, probably the most successful of them all because everybody, including my wife, watches I Love Lucy all the time um, <laughs> and uh, today. So, but the point is, those individual examples of success is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about success of the great number of people. You still have, as I mentioned, and as was mentioned by the person who introduced me, a large percentage of Hispanics, maybe close to 50%, who don't even graduate from high school. So while there are many uh, advantages in the Hispanic culture, the idea is to ensure that a larger percentage of Hispanics becomes assimilated into the culture of the United States. And what I'm concerned about in my book is that this is not happening today. While our next questioner is approaching, i just curious, the, the five-century siesta that you mentioned that has held down so much of the Hispanic uh, culture because of the legacy of Spanish colonialism, are you suggesting that Cuba was somehow inoculated against oh, that, no, no, no. Uh, that siesta? No, Cuba had the same problem. The, the, all, all I said was that the, the Cubans who left were the upper middle class, but they left the poor in Cuba, and they're still poor in Cuba. Some of my friends who've been to Cuba in the last week or so have told me about the astonishing amount of poverty that is in Cuba even today, and therefore Castro has followed this same ses legacy that I talked about. The, uh, worse because he has lost some of the people who had the most energy and the most ability to change conditions. Next question, please. Well, the United States embargo has a lot to do with that, too. Uh, as you noted, there are extreme class divisions uh, within Latin America. There are also extreme class divisions within the United States. Yeah. Uh, many of the right-wing dictators in Latin America, like Stroessner and Goulart and Somoza and Pinochet, were supported, or even in the case of Chile, installed by the United States. That, those policies have been exacerbated by IMF uh, impositions uh, as well as free trade agreements. Uh, 
wouldn't it benefit for collective uh, political initiatives if there was more class solidarity across uh, international borders uh, between working class elements in Latin America and uh, in the United States to reverse those kind of reactionary American foreign policies that have contributed so much to uh, Latin American poverty and to uh, the compulsion to immigrate, as well as exacerbating uh, class divisions here at home? Absolutely. The reason I mention the fact that we could influence what the leaders of Latin America do to improve the economic conditions of those countries is because we've interfered with them right. for several hundred years. In fact, when somebody says that Bush started a preemptive war in Iraq and we are not used to starting preemptive wars, that isn't true at all. We started a preemptive war against Santo Domingo right. in 1965. Right. We, we Guatemala, invaded that country. Guatemala, Guatemala Panama, all of these countries practically. Right. Uh, we have been responsible for that. Right, right. So therefore, we have such influence over those countries because we've invaded them and that we could, if we wanted to, force those leaders to improve the economic conditions of those countries. That's what I'm suggesting so that because they expect us to take action. But it takes more collective initiative from the lower orders of society and, and, and solidarity between them to get that process uh, yeah, I rolling. Wish that, I wish that it was so. You can't expect it to come from the top, no, no, obviously. I expect it to come from the people in the United States. Right. And I'll tell you why. Because the damaging influence of what has happened with the 500-year siesta in uh, Latin America is something that I refer to in my book. I point out to a poll that was taken by the United Nations in the year 2004, I believe, which interviewed about 17,000 people from all the Latin American countries. And would you believe that most of them said that they did not believe in democracy, that they really, that they really wanted to have a dictator because they said dictators get things done better. So that, unfortunately, this is the tragic legacy that we have to overcome. Congressman Medea, you pointed out uh, that the Asian uh, students of immigrant parents uh, are doing a superior job in, in the high schools, at both performance and, and in terms of dropouts and so on. Um, uh, and they uh, come from a, their, their parents came from a, a society that valued education. The Hispanics, as you pointed out, are coming from countries that have not had a, that have not valued education uh, historically. If it's likely that to pr to improve the performance of the Hispanic community, you're going to have to change this cultural attitude towards education. Right. Do you have any thoughts on how you can do this when you really have to deal with the community, the, the parents? less than the students to get this change in cultural attitude towards education? Well, it's not going to be easy, and that's why I wrote the book, because that gives me an opportunity to speak on television, as I'm doing now, and to speak on the radio and bring the message to people I've been interviewed on radio and television in uh, California, Texas, Arizona, and other places. And it takes a long time to get the message across, but there are many people who don't like what I say, in Hispanics, because they say I should not criticize the Hispanic community. But there are many others who do agree, so you need someone to begin to bring these facts out in public, which many, uh, which have not, has not been done up to now. Obviously, it's going to take time. You have to change the culture of the people, and that is not an easy thing to do. Do you have specific suggestions? that the Hispanic community should be considering Yeah, they should show up culture. at parent-teachers' conferences. They should uh, get involved and find out if the children are doing homework. They should not accept the fact that the children are passing from grade to grade because this practice of social promotion is very misleading. Many of the parents think if the kids got a report card saying they passed, that it means they're learning. If the social promotion is in place, it doesn't mean they're learning anything at all. So they have to find out what is going on. They have to make sure that they get the homework. They, have to, they should understand that education is not something that should be left to the educators alone because it's not going to happen. They have to get themselves involved. Go and meet the teachers. Uh, I uh, 
I teach at a, uh, at a college, the Graduate School of Education, uh, teachers who are getting their masters and PhDs. And they tell me that Hispanic parents very often do not show up. So that, you know, this is, these are very simple things. Other things, in the white community and the Asian community, when a child is born, the parents open up a bank account for a kid to go to college. This doesn't happen in the Hispanic community. Hispanic community, when a child is 17 years old, they're told to go out and get a job. That was okay in the old days, but now you have to make sure they graduate from high school and go on to college. So, actually, that was the, my exact question, but just sort of a follow-up. Um, what's your plans as far as your speaking engagements in the future and your involvement personally uh, as far as going to other locations? And are there other sort of well-known people? I was just thinking of athletes or musicians or people like that that younger people would know or younger families may recognize, uh, getting those people sort of involved in um, changing, you know, perceptions well, and culture. I, I hope so. I mean, I'm uh, involved with a number of people who are doing this, but they don't do it as passionately as I do. I, I've been much more involved in education because I had a chance to see it firsthand. For example, <clears throat> it was mentioned that I was chairman of the board of the city university. Actually, the problem is even worse than I pointed out in terms of the dysfunctional educational system because in the city university, which was when I went to City College, the Harvard of the poor, standards were lowered, once again, going back to the dual standard. They had a uh, theory known as open admissions because some students were rioting in 1969. The students wanted the high standards to be reduced so that anybody could go to college who wanted to go to college. At that time, John Lindsay was the mayor of New York, and he caved in, and he agreed to that. I opposed it. I was then borough president of the Bronx. What happened was the city university went downhill. It became a second-class high school. I, when I joined the board of trustees of the city university and became chairman, we found that one college where students, only 13% of the students were able to pass the uh, exit exam. And they were rioting because they wanted to get a college degree even though they couldn't speak English. So it took me 30 years and I abolished the open admission standard and we went back to having a serious university at CUNY. And now there are more Hispanic and black students going to, co to City College and to the university than there were before, which proves that if you raise the standards, people will rise up to meet them. So therefore, um, the reality is that uh, this, the double standard exists to a much larger degree than I was able to um, bring it out in this short uh, speech. Are, are there other well-known people from the Spanish or Latino community following your footsteps and you know, carrying the message out? Can you there are many who or? do, but they don't, they're not as, uh, as uh, forceful in public as I am. There are individuals who do it, but uh, mm -hmm. generally uh, people in, uh, you get more in the black community where you have people like uh, Cosby and you have people like Oprah who talk about uh, these problems. What kind of pushback have you encountered? You well, mentioned that there are some of the, in the Hispanic yeah, some community of the, who don't uh, like Hispanic, what you're saying. Yeah, they, they think that I shouldn't talk about this. They don't deny that what I say is true, but they think that I should not disparage the Hispanic community. I point out to them, it's not a disparagement. It's calling upon people to change the, uh, the view that they have so that we have an improvement in the entire community. Um, I have a two-part question. Uh, do you see any similarities uh, between yourself and uh, Senator Obama? And um, do you think that he would be a good leader for our country in eliminating these double standards? Well, I don't, uh, I don't understand his view about the racial issue. As I say, we look at it quite in a different way. Uh, we would not find a person like Senator Obama 
in terms of his racial background as anything unusual in Puerto Rico. This would be very common, and this would be very common in Latin America. Uh, it is perceived as a very dramatic thing in the United States because here the view is that if there's even a tiny bit of black blood in your system, that you are automatically an African-American. But this is a point of view that does not exist in, uh, in other countries, and certainly not in Latin America. And I'm sure that Senator Obama would know this. I don't know why he uh, has not refers, referred to it when he talks about a conversation on race. But what I said was, about eliminating the distinction to majority and minority, that to me is the ultimate conversation on race. Because only when that comes about that we'll be able to uh, be united. And when we get to the point where we, we obviously know who is white and who is black and who is mixed, but we, it does not become part of the official position of government. That's why I said in that sense, we are several generations ahead of the United States. That's why I also said, I don't want us to break down into which of us is white, black, or whatever, because that's not going to help us. And I would hope that Senator Obama would come around to this point of view. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Cuban American. I came here 40, 43 okay. years Could ago. Come a, little, come a little closer to oh. the microphone. And um, when I came here in 1966, there was no bilingual system. Right. So basically, I, you know, I had took me a few months to catch up, and I eventually I did. So when the bilingual system was incorporated, I thought it was great. And then I've noticed that a few friends of mine, the, the children went to school, they were going to the bilingual problem, they were struggling with the English. And then I told them, you know, I think that in my case, because I had to force myself to learn English, I adapted much better to the new language than what some of these ch uh, children did. And I sort of became ambivalent about, uh, you know, bilingual language. So uh, my question is, um, what do you propose as an alternative to, bi to the bilingual education? Well, I went to the same problem you did because I came here in 1941 and there was no bilingual education. And as I said, I was one of the leaders in establishing bilingual education. But the purpose was to ensure that the uh, people would be able to learn to speak English. And my view and the view of members of Congress who were with me then, uh, and I'm sure now, is that it should not go on forever. It should be like a couple of years. But what's happening is that in the meantime, a whole bilingual education lobby has become come into being, and they continue uh, teaching bilingual education to the same students for four years, six years, and eight years, and that doesn't work. So therefore, I would like it to go back to what the original intention of Congress was. No, I, I agree with you, because one thing that I mentioned to some of these people was that uh, it's good to have bilingual education if you first come here, you don't know, you don't know the language, you need help with it, but after a certain amount of time, it loses its usefulness. Exactly, right, I agree, yeah. that's the intention, just to be for a limited amount of time. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Badillo. The last time I heard your voice was when you were on the Barry Gray Show back around oh, 1969. Yes, I <laughs> so this is a true treat for me to, uh, to hear Thank your you. voice yeah. again when you were running against um, Mayor Lindsay. And uh, as a graduate of uh, Brooklyn College, I can tell you that uh, I went on to become a dentist, and I still practice dentistry in New England. But at, at that time, Tufts University uh, School of uh, Dentistry, 20% um, of their entering class of freshmen dentists were from the city of the City University of New York which was an incredible ratio, and horrifyingly, as the years progressed because of open admissions, uh, I saw that, uh, re uh, that percentage uh, uh, decline tremendously. Right. And uh, I give you so much credit for uh, cha changing the culture around at the City University and, uh, and uh, just to offer you my congratulations for your persistence and uh, getting, getting things uh, straightened Thank you. out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. Have you found a base of support in alumni, other alumni oh, from yes, City I'm University? 100%. In, in support I mean, of I, what you try to do I with the university? I meet people every day who say thank you for what you did to uh, 
save the city university. So I'd, that's uh, almost uh, unanimous. The irony is that for 30 years, no chancellor, no college president, and very few faculty ever complain. Now they're all for it. They always were for it, they say. Mm -hmm. Next question, please. We're all on the same page in terms of wanting Hispanics to be successful. We want all people to be successful. Success often has to do with self-esteem. So uh, education is one way of building self-esteem, right. but there are other ways of building self-esteem that may even come before that and may have to involve communities. Uh, and I wonder what you think in terms of beyond education needs to have happen so that Hispanics and other poor folks build self-esteem so that they can then learn. Well, they have to feel that they came here for a purpose. We are in, we're in the United States to take advantage of the opportunities that exist in the United States. They have to realize how vast the opportunities are to move ahead, how important it is to, in order to build self-esteem, to become a participant in the society and not to isolate yourself in Hispanic enclaves where you don't even have to learn the language because everybody else speak Spanish, and you become... That's one place where they feel self-esteem. I know, but they have to get out of that. That's what I'm trying to bring out. That, and the best place to get out of it is by getting an education that shows you what the opportunities are elsewhere. I mean, we have a, an incredible situation. What, what creates the bridge? I agree ideally with what you're saying, but there needs to be bridges that make it possible Well, the bridges, the bridges yeah. have to be created by community leaders. And, for example, I've been trying to get uh, uh, ministers to uh, reach out to their people and, mm -hmm. and uh, tell them about the importance of taking advantage. And other community leaders, those are one of the things that could be done. Next question, please. You need to you speak, your speak into I the just microphone. want to ask you, uh, regard to nowadays, whenever you go to any hospital in Massachusetts, you see everything is written now in Spanish uh, next to the English room or operation room, whatever. And everything now in Spanish. Is, are you say that this is good for any Spanish people uh, who come to this society? compared to other groups who don't have that opportunity to see every sign or any places, other, everything in Spanish, is it good? For, uh, no, it's not good, but the problem is there are some areas where you have to ensure that people take advantage of resources, and one of them is that people who are sick and who have to go to a hospital, that they be able to go, even if they can only do it, in Spanish, and the reason for that is that people may have contagious diseases, and that is why the mayor of the city of New York and the mayor of other cities, I think in Boston too, provides that if someone shows up in a hospital, you should not question their immigration status, because if you did, then they wouldn't show up in the hospital, and they might have a disease that would be contagious and spread to the rest of the population. Similarly, we want kids to be educated in the school system, so we want them to go to school and we don't encourage the teachers to question about the immigration status of the ch children, because otherwise they might not go. These are some of the things that lead to the problem, because if you didn't have the ability for people to go to a hospital and speak in their own language, they might not go, and the result might be that they could have tuberculosis, you know. Yeah. Tuberculosis exists, and uh, that would be very damaging to the to rest of the people. Society. Yeah. But to see everything written along with English, even though uh, it's helped to Hispanic, but to other groups like Portuguese, 
or any Haitians or Russians or whoever comes well, is not, they don't, nothing is there. Is it well, good? no, there are many uh, areas where you do have other languages where you have, for example, in Chinatown, signs are in, uh, in uh, Chinese in different parts of the city, at, at least as far as I know, the city of New York, different languages are used. And voting now uh, exists in many different languages as well. The reason I'm asking because as interpreter, I have seen how it became everywhere. It's in English and Spanish, but, and there's still a lot of Hispanic interpreters are needed in order to interpret. Oh yeah, you need them in court because otherwise you will not be able to have a fair trial unless the jury and the judge and the prosecutors can understand what's going on. So that's why you have that. There's no way you can uh, have, I can tell you as a lawyer, uh, uh, cross-examine a witness who doesn't speak English unless you have an interpreter. So that's a good, a positive uh, thing. Yeah, you need to do that. Otherwise, we would not, the whole uh, justice system would come to a halt. I'm going to jump in and, and press the point just a little bit more as well. Besides hospitals, besides interpreters in court, uh, I, if I understand the, the, the question right, there's now this phenomenon of press one for English, press two for Spanish. You never hear press two for Russian, press two for French, press two for uh, Gaelic. And, and that's and, the most prevalent. That's the most prevalent. But is it healthy? Language. Is that a good thing for, no, for American see, culture or for Hispanic But a lot of that Americans? is not done. Wait a minute. A lot of that is done by private enterprise. Every store has a sign saying "Se habla español" because they want customers to come in. That's why they do it. So this is part of globalization, so-called. Okay. Part of part, no, that's part of the people, the private enterprise wanting to make sure they get as many customers as possible. That's not government does not force them to do that, but yet. There's hardly any store that doesn't have a sign saying se habla español. You mentioned in the book not only bilingual education, but bilingual so-called uh, voting. voting. Yeah. What's, what, what are your views today about ballots for American elections being printed in other languages than English? Well, the Bilingual Voting Act that I supported in Congress only applied to Puerto Ricans who were American citizens. If you, and the reason for that is I, that was during the war in Vietnam. I was against the war in Vietnam. In fact, I never voted for the money to support the war in Vietnam. The people who are now running for office, like Obama and Senator Clinton, who say that they're against the war in Iraq, if you look up the record, they voted for the money to support the war in Iraq, which to me is hypocritical. If you really are against something, you don't vote for the money to carry that out. So. I got up on the floor of Congress and I said, the, the Puerto Ricans who are American citizens because they were made American citizens in 1917 should be able to vote, and I'll tell you why. You get a Puerto Rican who is, was born in the town that I was born in Puerto Rico, and he's drafted and sent to Vietnam even though he cannot speak English. And in Vietnam, he is wounded, and he comes back to live in New York City, he should be able to vote in New York City against the people who sent him to Vietnam. <laughs> and members of Congress agreed, and they approved that. But it was only intended to be for people who are American citizens who have a situation like the Puerto Ricans where they could be drafted and they could not speak the language. So therefore, they couldn't, they're good enough to be drafted couldn't speak the language, they should be able to vote, uh, even though they can't speak the language. Well, it was only that group. Sir. I, I have two questions. One is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, politicians up close in your distinguished career. I was yeah. wondering whether you could share with us uh, one or two who you thought were the most naturally talented that you've seen in your lifetime. In, well, I, I, I was very close to uh, Bobby Kennedy, for example. And uh, when I first met him, I didn't think that he was naturally talented because he was then the campaign manager for Jack Kennedy. And he was a nasty fellow then. He was giving orders to everybody. And remember, he used to, he was counsel to Joe McCarthy. And he was very conservative. But then, when his brother was killed, and he came back to New York to run for the Senate, and we got to be very close because I campaigned with him 
in many parts of the city, and I showed him what the poor look like, and I told him how to campaign among the poor. His personality changed, and he began to be identified more with the problems of the United States than he had been when he was Attorney General. So I don't know if he was naturally uh, mm -hmm. talented, but he developed that talent, so he must have had it in him. One other quick question. Um, what advice would you give um, younger politicians in terms of how to manage disappointment? Uh, and um, because, uh, I mean, obviously uh, there, was a there, there was a politician in New York who grew up in Riverdale in the Bronx who uh, never learned how to manage disappointment. So, but, but what would you suggest to young politicians who, who have that narcissism in them and are used to kind of winning and stuff, how to manage disappointment? Because I'm sure in your career, you know, you, you've seen... Well, you, you have to, if you want to be an insurgent and be against the established order, as I have been, you have to expect you're going to be disappointed because you, you're going up against the odds. And now it's even harder than ever because now you almost have to be a multimillionaire to run for office. You, nobody can live in the salary you make in Congress because you need two homes, one in the home district and one in Washington. So it's very difficult these days for young people to break into the political system without being enveloped by it and uh, having to succumb to it. So that's the problem. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Badillo, I was uh, intrigued with the idea of someone describing himself as an ex-liberal coming to talk in Boston. Um, and I work for an organization, an education reform organization, that is considered uh, pretty far left of center, and we probably are close to 100% in line with your views. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering why you call you, and I hear a revolutionary in your ideas. Uh, I, there's very little I disagree with in what you're saying. Why do you call yourself an ex-liberal? Because, you see, when I started in politics and when I got involved in the 60s uh, with Lyndon Johnson, whom I knew, Politicians were talking about ending a war on poverty, ending poverty in the United States. And there were promises, and I was very young, and I agreed with that. And they were making promises about how we're going to provide jobs for all, and housing for all, and health care for all, and all these benefits. And then I found in Congress that there really was not no intention of really doing that at all. That the only thing that was believed on was doing little pilot projects, providing a few jobs here, a few housing projects there, a few other things there. And, the, and yet I find that even today, you get Senator Obama and Senator Clinton talking about how they're going to, in fact, when he announced for president, Senator Obama said he wanted to eradicate poverty. He has said that he wants to increase teacher salaries, which has nothing to do with the President of the United States. They are over-promising, and I left the Democratic Party because these promises continue to be made, and when I look at the faces of poor people in poor areas of the city, like the South Bronx or Harlem, and they watch these politicians making these promises, people believe them. They think that, in fact, government is going to solve the problems, and I walked away from that and now I say to people, there is an answer to poverty, but it's not government. Government is not going to do any of these things. The answer to poverty is to get a good education. If you get an education, you'll be able to get your own job, your own housing, your own health care, and provide for your family's needs. So don't listen to those fellows who promise the world if you vote for them, because it's not going to happen. That's why I changed my point. Well, that's a good answer, and what, to my ear, it sounds like is that you don't like the hypocrisy, you see. Exactly. Thank you. But that's why, that's why unfortunately, the so-called liberals do. They make a tremendous amount of promises, but then watch their voting records. As I said, 
couple of months ago, there was a vote of funding the war in Iraq in the Senate. You know what the vote was? A hundred to nothing. Every single senator voted for the money. And yet they go on, probably this Sunday, complaining about how much it costs. Nancy Pelosi was complaining today in Face the Nation when I drove uh, here from New York about the cost of the war. They all voted for it. That is really massive hypocrisy. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just... <laughs> I wanted to ask you about um, public school standards. You're talking about having one standard for everyone, um, especially in places with really high... Mexican uh, numbers of Mexican immigrants, uh, southern su southern Arizona, southern Texas, having one school standard um, is basically lowering the school standard. That's what that's what's being done. So um, I guess I was just asking you to reflect a little bit on this problem. I, I didn't I didn't get to your question. Um, well, Maybe you're too close to the microphone. Oh. Not that far away. No. <laughs> Um, well, I just wanted to ask you to reflect about how, in places with really high numbers of Mexican immigrants, keeping one standard is basically lowering the school standard. That's what's being done. It's a huge problem. Keeping one standard is lowering the standards? Lower, keeping one standard for our, everyone in public schools, what's being done is they're lowering the school standards. Every no, no, the standards are very low in public schools. That's what I said, that they have little tricks, I call it despicable tricks, like social promotion, tracking, they lower standards. I want them to go back to having one standard for all so that everyone can get a good education because the educational system is good for the people who get a real education without all of these things that make the system dysfunctional. What I'm trying to do, and this is more difficult than even trying to get the Hispanic community to change its culture. Because at one point when I was deputy mayor, I was able to get rid of social promotion. But then it came back when another mayor came up. And then I've been spending the last few years trying to get rid of social promotion under Mayor Bloomberg. And it's got to be done, it's, it's been done a year by year. I got rid of it on the third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, which to me is ridiculous because the system doesn't make sense for any grade. Should have abolished it in all grades. But that shows you how difficult it is. And I'm sure that after Mayor Bloomberg leaves, somebody will move to restore social promotion again. So having, going back to having a single standard is a very difficult and maybe impossible thing to do. But somebody has to talk about it in very direct terms, as I'm doing now. Let me ask one final question before we okay, close. Fine. You've spent a, a lifetime in, in, in and around politics. Yeah. Are there politicians, uh, political figures within the Hispanic community that you see coming up now that you would call our attention to as people who, who seem to have their heads screwed on straight and to understand what it is that, that needs doing? No, there are too many who have been discouraged because of the difficulties of going into politics these days, like having, needing a much larger amount of money a matter of fact, I think if I were to go into politics now, I would go make money first and then go into politics because it takes such a huge amount of money to really get involved successfully in politics and still remain independent. Well, on that slightly distressing note, let me ask you all to join me in thanking our speaker tonight, Herman Bedillo. Thank you.